We're here today on the banks of the Big South Fork of the Cumberland River. This is one of many rivers that cut through deep gorges in this part of Kentucky. This flows north up into the Cumberland River in Lake Cumberland and eventually down through Wolf Creek Dam, back down into Tennessee and down through a system of lakes, uh, through Nashville, up through western Kentucky and joins into the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. And then uh, down through Memphis and all the way to New Orleans and out into the Gulf of Mexico. That warm water there in the Gulf of Mexico as the breeze blows past the, uh, the warm water, the moisture evaporates and comes right back up here and pours down as rain. It's amazing to think about the, the water cycle. And today I want to explore this river a little bit with you. I want to take you on a journey. And as we journey together, I want to look at some other rivers, talk about some rivers, especially rivers that we find in this book, the Bible, God's Word. But before we go any further in our exploration, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this beautiful day that you have given to us. Lord, as we explore, as we explore this part of your creation, and as we explore your word, I pray that you will guide us and direct us, keep us safe, and help us today to draw closer to you, to have a deeper, fuller knowledge of you as we think about this swelling river. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Such a beautiful river, even more beautiful down here than it was from up above. Rivers like this flow down from the mountains and heights. Little streams form into little rivulets, into, into rivers that form larger and larger rivers as, the, as the more and more tributaries come in from each side. As they pour down over the rocks like this, they collect little bits of sediment and sometimes even bits of salt from the soil that washes down down, down river, and eventually into the ocean. Over in the land of Israel, there's really only one river that's of much importance. It's known as the Jordan River. It starts above the Sea of Galilee and flows into the sea, and then from the Sea of Galilee, it flows down through the, the midst of what was uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, especially kind of forming most of the eastern border uh, of Israel until eventually it empties into a sea, but not the ocean. It empties into a basin that is well below sea level. Now over the centuries, like any river, the Jordan River has carried its share of sediment and salt down, down, down into the sea. But there in the Dead Sea, the salt, the water has nowhere to go. The sun and the warm winds evaporate the water out of that basin, leaving behind the salt 
until over the centuries it has built up so much salt there in the Dead Sea that nothing, nothing can live in the Dead Sea, with the exception of maybe a few tiny little bits of, of, uh, uh, of exotic organisms, which is, of course, why it's called the Dead Sea. But, of course, there are other rivers in the Bible, rivers that are very different from the river that we're on today, very different from the Jordan River. And these, in particular, are some of the rivers that I'd like to explore as we explore today from God's Word. Well, just about any journey in the Bible ought to begin at the beginning. So let's turn on our Bibles to Genesis and look to see if we can find some special rivers like this. Genesis chapter 2 actually speaks of rivers. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8 speaks about the special garden that God planted there in Eden. It says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Verse 9 describes the tree of life that was in the midst of the garden. And verse 10 speaks about a river that went out of Eden to water the garden. But this is where the river gets interesting. Verse 10 it says, And from there it parted and became four river heads. And it gives us the names here in the next verses. Verse 11, the name of the first is Pishon. Going down to verse 13, the name of the second is Gihon. Verse 14, the name of the third is Hittichal. And going on the fourth river is Euphrates. Four rivers. One of them, the Euphrates. A mighty river. Now, these are rivers before the flood. Their locations today, we, we have no idea where these rivers were. Unless, of course, the river Euphrates is the same river, but the other rivers we, we've never heard of. And yet four mighty rivers come from one stream, one stream that flows from the garden of God. A river coming out from Eden, watering the garden, and turning into four mighty river heads. Now we don't have rivers like that today. Rivers like this Yes, they start small and grow, but they grow because other tributaries come in. They don't sm start small and grow until they can become more and more rivers. In fact, the only thing like this, perhaps we might have a river delta, like the Amazon River that, that expands out and out as it goes into the sea, but even still, it's nothing like the rivers of Eden. It seems to defy all logic. It seems to defy all science. Unless, unless there was something special about the source of that river. Let's continue our journey and see if we can discover the source of this river of Eden. Oh, there it is. These rivers of Eden seem to have a mysterious, perhaps supernatural source, so that the riv one river that could flow out could form four rivers. But it's not the only time in the Bible that we find such a river. We find in the story of the Exodus, as Moses led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, it wasn't long before their supply of water ran low. And they were walking through the desert and they had no water and no streams and no rivers, nowhere to find any water. And they complained to Moses. And God told Moses to go and strike a rock, to strike one of the rocks there in the desert, out in the desert sand. And as he struck that rock, the water gushed forth. It says in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. 
that water continued to flow and flow and flow and to sustain them throughout the years that Israel wandered there in the wilderness. Looking back on this time, the psalmist records in Psalm 78, verses 15 and 16, says he split the rocks in the wilderness. He gave them drink in abundance, like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Water from a rock, a mysterious supernatural source, not of ordinary water, but of living water. In the time of Moses, God brought water out of the rock for the children of Israel. But that water coming out of the rock and sustaining the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness became a symbol of God's care and God's grace for his people. In the time of the prophet Ezekiel, this was many years later, when the children of Israel, because of their apostasy, because of their idolatry and sin, were about to go into captivity to Babylon. The prophet Ezekiel came with many messages from God, messages of warning, warning that the Babylonians would come and bring Israel into captivity. But the prophet Ezekiel didn't stop there. You see, God, through the prophet Ezekiel, sent messages of hope to the children of Israel, messages about the restoration of Israel, and how, even after the Babylonian captivity, the children of Israel would return and would see a glorious, glorious and triumphant kingdom that would last for eternity. Now, of course, we understand as Christians that the ultimate fulfillment of these prophecies of Ezekiel and many of the other Old Testament prophecies happens in an era of the New Testament, when not just the children of Israel, literally, but all of God's children will be united together in an eternal kingdom. But nevertheless, we see these prophecies given to the children of Israel as they were going off into captivity to bring hope, to bring encouragement. And in one of these prophecies, God shows Ezekiel a vision of a temple, a temple that we know from history has never been built, a grand and glorious temple. You see, when the Babylonians came, they destroyed the temple that Solomon had built, this magnificent and glorious temple. And after the restoration of Jerusalem, the second temple that was built could hardly hold a candle to the glory of that first temple of Solomon. And yet this temple that God described in vision to Ezekiel was a temple more glorious, in fact, than the temple that Solomon had built. And I want to draw your attention to one aspect of this temple. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 47. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. And I'll read you some of this description. Ezekiel again is in vision, and he's being led by this angel who is showing him all around this temple and measuring and, and taking notes of all the dimensions of this temple. And it says in Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 1, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east, and water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. So here you have the temple. He's seen all of this glorious structure. And it seems as though this little stream is pouring out from under the door, under the curtain, and coming out and flowing down towards the east. But notice this stream. Notice what happens as he follows this small stream that comes out of the temple. Verse 2, he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running on the, out, on the right side. Then, when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and brought me through the waters. The water came to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 cubits and brought me through the waters, and the water came to my knees. Again, he measured 
and brought me through and the water came up to my waist. And he measured 1,000 and it was a river that I could not cross for the water was too deep. Well... Whoa! Well, as Ezekiel has crossed and recrossed and recrossed this river, and every time that he has crossed over, it has gotten deeper. From the tiny stream that flowed out from the door of the temple to now a river that he can't swim across. And as he is pondering this, this mystery, this mystery of a river flowing out from the temple of God, he hears a voice. Verse 6, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when I returned there, on the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. And then he hears his guide speaking to him again. Verse 8, Then he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region goes down into the valley and enters the sea. Now, of course, from Jerusalem, when you go down into the east, go into the valley and into the sea, this is the Dead Sea. This is the sea of salt where nothing can live. The water goes down there from the temple, and when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live, and there will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. What a beautiful picture. A river flowing out from the temple, from God's throne, and wherever it flows, it restores life. Instead of bringing the salt and the sediment and the pollution down from wherever the rains fall and pooling together until it forms a sea of death, now this river of God flows down in its life-giving current, not only bringing life and fresh water, but in fact healing the salty sea, healing its waters so that there where nothing could live, now life can live again. Is there somewhere else in the Bible that speaks of this river, this water of life? Is there something else that speaks of these trees that grow along the banks of the river? Oh, yes, there is. Along the banks of this mighty river flowing out from the temple grew all kinds of trees. Ezekiel describes these trees in verse 12 along the bank of the river on this side and on that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Oh, what a beautiful and glorious picture. Not only a river, but along its banks, trees that, with fruit that will never fail. Trees with leaves of healing. What does a tree represent in the Bible? If you look at the first Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, describes the life of a godly man, a godly person. In Psalms chapter 1 and verse 3, we read these words, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Get this, friends. Is it possible that the trees that are growing along the side of this river represent people, you and I, who by the grace, by the virtue of the grace that they impart, with their roots sunk deep in this river of life, 
become conduits to take this blessing of the water of life to others, to, to soak up deep from that grace that flows from the sanctuary, and then through leaves and fruit to bring healing, grace, and joy to a world in need? I believe so, my friends. Isaiah ch chapter 58 says this, Isaiah 58 and verse 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. The prophet Joel and the prophet Zechariah also describe this same river, this same stream that flows out from the throne of God and waters the earth and waters the trees. What is the difference between these rivers of earth and this river of life that flows from God's throne? Well, as we go on further down the river, we'll see more of these differences. The rivers here on earth, as beautiful as they are, form a system that drains the excess rainwater out from the forest, perhaps from the cities and neighborhoods. And all of this water flows down and as you can see here, collects silt and dirt and things that aren't always the most pleasant to see. Now this is one of the cleaner rivers in this part of the country because most of the watershed here is national forest or national park but even still we see the traces the signs of sin but the rivers of paradise flow not from the runoff of this world but flow directly from god's throne in pure life-giving ways the rivers of this earth flow from many sources but the rivers of paradise flow from only one source. And two, rivers like this here on this earth are subject to flooding. When we get too much rain, this placid river becomes a raging torrent. And then, then in the drought season, when we really could use the river the most, when it would be the most useful to have this life-giving water, then these rivers dry up. But the rivers of paradise never fail, never dry up. They flow 12 months of the year, bringing life and bounty. And yes, the water of the rivers of this earth, if it pools in one place, brings death. It forms a bed of salt. And yet, the rivers of paradise not only bring life, but bring healing cleansing, even purifying the salt of the rivers of this earth. I long for those rivers, don't you? So who or what is the source of this living water? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, speaking of that time when God brought water out of the rock for the children of Israel, he says all drank from the same spiritual rock, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus himself had an encounter. It's a familiar story. As they were traveling through Samaria, he met a woman there beside Jacob's well. And in that conversation with this woman there at the well, he says to her, whoever drinks this water, the waters of this earth, the water of Jacob's well, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst. Why? He says, 
The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Just like this water that sprang up in the desert, so the grace of Christ springs up in the heart into a fountain of living water. Jesus says in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, there on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And of course, he spoke about this, it says in verse 39, concerning the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that will be poured out. My friends, Jesus himself, Jesus himself is that source, is that fountain of living water. Jesus, the Son of God, he is the one who became that fountain of water that poured out under the door of the temple. And yes, he is the one, the Lamb, who sits upon the throne. And from that throne flow streams of water, even through the new earth. What about your life? Who are you? What makes up the person known as you? Perhaps all of us can look back to a time in our childhood, a time of carefree innocence, like the streams that tumble down from the mountainside in purity and freshness, reviving the earth. Oh, to be there in the innocence of childhood again, but somehow, as life progresses, it seems that our, our lives, as they grow and we build experience, yes, they also become, as it were, perhaps like this river. Wide, yes, beautiful, but also polluted. Polluted with the things of this earth, the circumstances, perhaps a childhood framed with abuse scars like the rugged boulders that are strewn upon the shores of this river. Perhaps, like the muddy and sometimes troubled waters, our lives have gone through kinks, twists and turns. Perhaps, deep inside, is the knowledge of some hidden guilt, a sin that no matter how hard we try, we cannot get the mastery over. Like the waters of this earth, so often we try to cleanse our lives by adding yet another stream, yet another source. In school, on, once I had a professor that told me, the solution to pollution is dilution. Just add more good things and it will balance out the bad things. But if a river is truly poisoned, no amount of fresh water pouring into that stream can outweigh the poison of that river. In the same way our lives, when poisoned by sin, no amount of other things that we add to our lives can outweigh that sin. Oh, we may add, add good things, we may do many good things, and yes, it may bring happiness and joy for a little while. But in the end, our lives, like so many of the rivers of this earth, are polluted, polluted by sin. And just like the muddy Jordan, we know that sooner or later, they will end in the Dead Sea. But now consider another river. Consider another river, not like the rivers of this earth, but a river of life. A river that flows not from a thousand hills and streams, but from one source. A river that flows directly from the throne of God. Not with water of earth, but with living water. A river that flows with water able to cleanse the darkest sin. 
with water like the water flowing from Ezekiel's temple, able to cleanse even the Dead Sea. Ezekiel saw this river. He saw it flowing out from under the threshold of the door. He saw it expand and widen and flow down all the way into the Jordan and down into the Dead Sea, where its waters cleansed, yes, the Dead Sea. But one thing Ezekiel didn't see is truly where this river came from. He saw it flowing out under the door of that temple, but we can see more. Yes, we can see more. And friends, I want to invite you to come with me to the very source of this river. No, Ezekiel couldn't see the very source of that stream. He only saw it coming from under the door of the temple. But to us, that veil is open. And we see the very source of that stream, that river of life. Jesus himself says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Yes, Jesus himself is the source of that stream. And even his words were a mystery at the time to his disciples. Just before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus sat with his disciples there in an upper room, and he gave them a cup, a cup filled with pure grape juice. And he says to his disciples, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins for the forgiveness of sins, for the cleansing of that stream of earth by the stream of heaven. Just a few hours later, Jesus, the Son of God, hung on a cruel cross. And his blood dripped down from his head. As he passed, as he breathed his last, soldier there took a spear and thrust it into his side and out came a stream of blood and water a tiny trickle that stream has since grown to provide an atonement sufficient and more for you for me for everyone in this world like the stream that flowed from Ezekiel's temple, that stream that flowed from the riven side of our Savior has grown into a mighty river, a torrent of grace. And there's nothing, there's no one in this world that is too steeped in sin that cannot be cleansed by that river of grace and mercy. In the words of that famous hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Friend, what are the rivers and streams of this earth compared to that river that flows from the throne of God? I don't care where you've come from. I don't care how muddy or polluted may be the river of your life. When your life is touched by this river of grace, friend, your life will never be the same. Like the waters of the Dead Sea, when they were touched by that river flowing from Ezekiel's temple, the waters, the salty waters themselves, were cleansed. And that's not all. Surely, this is enough. Yes, it's more than enough. The triumph of God's grace today. If that were all, we could thank God for the rest of our lives. But friends, that river flows not just now, but it flows into the future, throughout our lives, and for all eternity.
And how can we partake of this healing and cleansing river? We find in the words of Isaiah, chapter 55, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Friends, this fountain of grace is poured out from the throne of God, poured out for all. And all we have to do is to come in, to plunge in, to grasp by faith his merits and allow his grace to fill our lives. And yes, he transforms our lives today. All who have, who have experienced this know what it means to live in the grace of the Lamb of God. But it's not just today. We find in Revelation chapter 7, we find these beautiful words, the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And you remember that river from Ezekiel? You remember that river that became four heads in the Garden of Eden? Well, when we find Eden fully restored in the very end of time, Revelation chapter 22, it says he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, and look where it comes from, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Notice this, in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There was no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Friends, all the way back there in the Garden of Eden, that garden had a river flowing from God's throne to water that garden, to sustain the life of the tree and the animals and the plants, and yes, to sustain the life of Adam and Eve and their descendants. And yes, they forfeited that tree of life, and we have meandered around this world of sin, partaking of all the streams of this earth. But one day soon, God is going to restore that Garden of Eden. One day soon, he's going to bring back those rivers of paradise. And it all starts from the throne of the Lamb. Friend, my question for you is this. Will you partake of that river today? Will you allow that river of grace to cleanse your life? Will you allow it to transform you? No matter where you've come from, no matter what you've experienced in your life, no matter how polluted the river of your life may be, will you allow him to cleanse that? Friend, then, will you, like the trees along the river, become a conduit of grace to carry that grace and love to others, even for the healing of the nations? Friend, will you commit today to be part of that eternal kingdom, to drink from that river of life in the earth made new? I hope invite you to pray with me today. Father in heaven, Lord, as we contemplate this, this beautiful river, the rivers of Eden, that will soon become the rivers of paradise restored. Help us, Lord, to partake of that river of grace. Lord, how can we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for shedding his own blood to supply that stream so that we can be again part of your eternal kingdom. I pray that you will bless each one who is listening today. May our hearts be renewed, restored, cleansed, and healed by your river. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.